Hello, my name is Piper Hale. The Salem witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts were a grim time. Over 200 people were accused of witchcraft, 19 people were hanged, one man was pressed to death, and others died in prison. 1692 was a time that the people of current Danvers, Massachusetts wished they could forget. The Puritans were a very religious group of people in England that felt that the Church of England was drifting away from the idea that every person either goes to heaven or hell. The Puritans wanted to purify this idea, so in 1630, they settled in Massachusetts to start a more purified version of the Church of England. It all started in February of 1692 when Samuel Paris's 9-year-old daughter, Betty Paris, and her 11-year-old cousin, Abigail Williams, were playing fortune-telling games because that was one of their only forms of entertainment. Afterwards, they started exhibiting strange behavior. People didn't understand what it was, so they blamed witchcraft. And the girls accused three women, Tichuba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne. Under the British law, associating with a witch or the devil was a felony. Out of the three women, Tichuba was the only one to confess. She ended up surviving, but the other women were not so lucky. Sarah Good was sentenced on June 29, 1692, and was hanged on July 19. Sarah Osborne died in prison on May 10, 1692. 12-year-old Anne Putnam Jr., 17-year-old Mary Walcott, and 17-year-old Elizabeth Hubbard also started exhibiting strange behavior, and they started accusing people too. When William Phipps, the governor, came to Salem and saw the chaos, he created a court of Oyer and Terminator to try and help the situation. This court was very flawed as it allowed spectral evidence. The head judge of the court, William Stoughton, had no legal education and the court used harsh methods to get confessions out of people. Bridget Bishop was the first to be affected by the court as well as being the first to be hanged on Gallows Hill on June 10th. Many more people were being accused and the prisons were starting to fill up. Witches were kept in horrible conditions which caused some people to die while locked up. Another accused was Rebecca Nurse, a model Salem citizen. If she could be accused, then no one was safe. She was hanged on July 19th, 1692. There was a lot of bad feeling around her death and it caused a backlash on Samuel Paris, the Reverend, and he eventually apologized on November 26, 1694. People didn't accept it, so he moved to Stowe, Massachusetts in 1697. The girls eventually started accusing the more powerful people in the community, and not just the outcasts. Margaret Thatcher, Jonathan Corwin's mother-in-law, two sons of former Governor Simon Bradstreet, the wife of Reverend John Hale, and William Phipps' wife were all accused, but none of these people were arrested. At this point, things were out of control. Judge Corwin ignored letters and pleas to stop the trials, and Judge Hawthorne continued manipulating and bullying the accused to use their words against them. Judge Hawthorne was very religious and took witch accusations very seriously. Judge Corwin lived in the witch house, the last standing structure linked to the trials. No actual witches lived there or were imprisoned in the house. Anne Putnam Jr. ended up being the main accuser in the trials. She accused 62 people during the trials. George Burroughs had some trouble with the Putnams in the past, so one day he was taken from his home in Wells, Maine and was accused of leading the witches and being one himself. A piece of evidence that they had was that they found toads in his home, which were believed to be instruments of the devil. He was taken to Salem and questioned. He was a respectable person, so when he was put in prison, 32 people signed a petition to get him out. It did not work. He was hanged on August 19, 1692. However, before he was hanged, he recited the Lord's Prayer perfectly, and witches were not supposed to be able to do that. He was hanged anyways. A big factor in the end of the trials was cotton and increased mather. Cotton was a minister, and Increase was his son. They wrote about the use of spectral evidence in court. Cases of coincidence concerning evil spirits, personating men, witchcrafts, and valuable proofs of guilt, and such are accused with that crime, was what they wrote. It was based on a sermon he preached on October 3rd, 1692, and he wrote, It were better than ten suspected witches should escape, than one innocent person should be condemned. This made judges doubt the use of spectral evidence. The trials finally ended after a long nine months of accusations, trials, and executions. After Mather's sermon changed views on spectral evidence and the governor's wife herself was accused, the governor had had enough. Thomas Brattle's letter to the governor on October 8, 1692 finally pushed him over the edge, and on October 29, 1692, William Phipps dissolved the court of Oyer and Terminer. The remaining in jail were finally released in May 1693. The new court was more fair and didn't allow spectral evidence. Not many apologized for the trials, but a few did. Anne Putnam Jr. was the only afflicted girl to apologize. 
She publicly apologized in 1706 for her role in the trials. Judge Samuel Sewall was the only judge to apologize for the trials. He took the blame for the trials and apologized in January 1697. The Salem Witch Trials were a great learning point for the future courts of today. There was conflict between the people of Salem and it caused the trials, but once people finally realized that the whole thing had gotten out of hand, they compromised, dissolved the court of Oyer and Terminer, and released the remaining accused from jail. If the governor had not received the letter from Thomas Brattle, his wife had not been accused, and Mather had not given his sermon, the trials may not have ended. Thanks to the trials, modern courts are organized and fair.